Thank you so much. As we gather to honor one of our nation's greatest leaders, Calvin Coolidge, I'm privileged to introduce a distinguished leader and public servant, the great 33rd governor of South Dakota, Christy Nome. <clears throat> President Coolidge, a man of great character and integrity, had a belief in limited government, individual liberty, and economic prosperity for all as a moral imperative. Governor Noem's leadership embodies the same principles. Like President Coolidge, Governor Noem has demonstrated a remarkable sense of responsibility, integrity, and determination. Her dedication to upholding the rule of law and protecting the rights and freedoms of her constituents testifies to her unwavering commitment to the principles that have made our country great. We heard yesterday about how then Massachusetts Governor Coolidge undertook progressive practical reforms to care for the working conditions of men and women, their social standing, and their communities and families. His principles were grounded in the hills of Vermont where his family were small business owners, farmers, and community servants. Governor Nome's belief in the inherent God-given dignity of the people of South Dakota, their families and community, springs from similar plain, from a similar lessons growing up on a farm on the plains of South Dakota as a rancher, farmer, and small business owner. Governor Nome's recent book, Not My First Rodeo, Lessons from the Heartland, unusually tells the story of her family and community, not politics. Marked by love as well as tragedy, Governor No makes a modest, non-political pay on to South Dakota, full of gratitude for a sense of duty and devotion toward her family and community. No surprise then that the governor, like Coolidge, has successfully kept taxes low, limited government regulation and intrusion, and fought to keep government open and honest all of which have helped people recover, grow the economy, and develop their workforce. Governor Nome has respected the rights of her people by trusting them, trusting them to exercise their personal responsibility to make the right decisions or best decisions for themselves, their loved ones, and in turn, their communities. Governor Nome stood apart from the crowd when she protected vulnerable populations while keeping the lifeblood of businesses and schools open. Governor Nome has faith in South Dakota and its people. Someone got that, all right. <laughs> that faith was reciprocated when Governor Nome was reelected with the largest vote total in the history of South Dakota last year. On becoming the Massachusetts Senate president, Coolidge delivered his famous Faith in Massachusetts speech saying, Men do not make laws, they do but discover them. Laws must be justified by something more than the will of the majority. They must rest on the eternal foundation of righteousness. Governor Nome leads a state that captures the spirit of Western independence with the humble moral framework of its state motto, under God, the people rule. I cannot help but note that one popular president from the green mountains of Vermont announced while in the Black Hills of South Dakota that he chooses not to run. Perhaps a governor in South Dakota will choose otherwise. <laughs> Thank you, Governor, for your leadership, for your service to our country, and for being a shining example of the American spirit that Coolidge so deeply embodied. Let's give a warm Coolidge welcome to Governor Christy Noem a leader making a difference for the people of South Dakota, and by her example, all Americans. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Thank you for inviting me to participate in your meetings and your luncheon today to speak about a wonderful man who loved this country and served with humbleness and uh, keeping his focus on the people. Uh, my name is Christy Nome, and I am the governor of South Dakota. 
I know that some people get confused about that. For those of you who don't know the difference between South and North Dakota, North Dakota has the oil. <laughs> South Dakota has Mount Rushmore. So I still think we got the better end of the deal. Um, we are thrilled about being the home of Mount Rushmore, and uh, we are very proud of the men on that monument, but also recognize there could be another face up there as well. Um, I want to thank Amity for inviting me to be here with all of you today. Late last year, she came to South Dakota and gave a very inspirational talk to my staff and to my cabinet, and then also gave um, some remarks at a local university um, about uh, President Coolidge and also just about serving this country and how important history is and our knowledge of it to a pres preserving our way of life. I hope that I can be just a little bit as inspiring today as she was when she made her trip to South Dakota. I also have my husband Brian who is with me here today. He is the first, first gentleman of South Dakota so if you would welcome him as well. I also have some other staff that's with me. My chief of staff is here, Mark Miller, and his wife, Mindy. <laughs> Ian and Madison are with me as well. I also have someone here that's very special to me, a friend of mine, but someone who, when I served in Congress for seven years, served as my chief of staff, uh, but then he quit on me. He um, wasn't going to come back to South Dakota when I ran for governor, so I still like to torture him over the fact that he uh, didn't hang with me when I made a switch, but Jordan Stoick was a phenomenal um, chief of staff when I served here in Congress, and I'd like to recognize him as well for being here today. I'm here today to talk to you about a president whose face is not on Mount Rushmore, uh, although some think he should be. Uh, we're all here to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Calvin Coolidge's presidency. And believe it or not, he's one of the biggest reasons why we're all able to enjoy Mount Rushmore today. One of the things that I love about President Calvin Coolidge is that even though he was from the East Coast, he understood the American farmer. He once stated that agriculture holds a position in this country that it was never before able to secure anywhere else on earth. Now, what does that mean? He recognized that in America, we don't only grow our own food, that we grow the world's food too. The eastern half of South Dakota is part of the Great Plains, and the Great Plains is the most productive farmland in the world. In the months just before our fall harvest, our crops actually produce more oxygen than the Amazon rainforest. In South Dakota, we do truly produce the world's food, and it's the safest and most affordable food supply that can be generated anywhere in the world. We do it better than anyone else as well. It's amazing how often that I'm able to apply the lessons that I learned on the farm growing up to leadership and to politics. I think most of you know I've spent my life farming and ranching in South Dakota in the northeastern part, portion of the state with our family. Now my dad consistently was a tough man. I tell people all the time he was a cowboy. Um, in fact, he would wake us up in the mornings by yelling up the stairs, get up. More people die in bed than anywhere else. <laughs> I always wondered if that was really true. And, but, um, you know, but he also told us all the time that we don't complain about things in our family. We fix them. And that was a big motivator for me to always be solving problems and to be looking for solutions. He was a man who insisted that his children not walk behind him and follow him when we did our day's work, that we had to stay right beside him. And he walked fast. So most of the time, he would have us four children running alongside of him, trying to keep up with all the tasks that he was assigning us each day. I remember one day we were out fixing fence. And I was probably 10 or 11 years old, and we were building fence and pounding posts in the ground. And he turned to me and he said, where's the post pounder? Where's the post mall? And I looked at him and I said, it's in the pickup. He said, well, go get it. And I could tell he was mad at me. I ran to the pickup. I got the post mall. I came running back to him. And as I handed it to him, he looked at me and pointed his finger at my face. And he said, you should know what I need before I know what I need. I couldn't figure out what that meant. <laughs> How in the world was I ever going to know what he needed before he knew what he needed? But over the years, I learned that what he was trying to do was teach us children to think ahead, 
to always be strategic, to see what he would need three steps before he actually needed it to be efficient, to make sure that things went smoothly and we could get our work done faster. We had to work hard, but we always had to work smart as well. You know, that really is the American dream. If you do those things, you will be successful. And throughout our history, America has been great because we have the freedom to work both hard, but also smart. That's the American work ethic. We must every day advance freedom and that work ethic if we hope to continue preserving this greatest nation in history. On Labor Day in 1924, President Coolidge gave a powerful speech about the importance of the American work ethic. At the time, no other nation had ever celebrated Labor Day before. Coolidge pointed out that it was a uniquely American holiday. He began his speech by saying, I can't think of any American man or woman preeminent in the history of our nation who did not reach their place through toil. I can't think of anything that represents the American people so honestly as honest work. He reminded his audience that we never had a government under our constitution that was not put into office by the votes of the toilers. He knew that working American men and women were the ones who drove our nation's destiny. I couldn't agree more. But today our nation is beginning to lose sight of that work ethic. The current administration here in Washington is pursuing welfare policies that could be accurately described as European style socialism. President Coolidge warned about this in his Labor Day speech too when he said, I do not need to import any foreign economic ideas or any foreign government. We had better stick to the American brand of government, the American brand of equality, and the American brand of wages. America had better stay American. President Coolidge would be dismayed if he saw the state that American labor was in 99 years later, particularly in this post-COVID America. Our nation's labor force participation rate, it's reaching dangerous lows. Not enough adults are working, and this is a trend that, he, that has um, continued for decades, but it really escalated during this COVID pandemic. In January of 2020, our nation's labor force participation rate was 63.6%, and it had been steadily dropping for years. By April 2020, just three months later, it had plummeted to 60.1%. It's risen since, but it still is only back to 62.4%. I know that's a lot of numbers that I'm throwing out to you, but what do they actually mean? They mean that the American people have not gotten back to work since the pandemic. Extended unemployment benefits, greater access to government welfare have led too many Americans deciding to stay home and to collect a government check. That's the story across this country. But meanwhile, a great post-pandemic phenomenon known as the Great Resignation also swept the country. A record number of Americans have quit their jobs. And this has led to the most job openings that our country has seen in history. Businesses can't find enough employees that they need, which leads to a decline in customer service, which leads to frustrated customers, which leads to more people quitting because of their negative workplace environment. It is a vicious cycle. The Bureau of Labor Statistics indicates that the recent quit rates are too high to be explained solely by labor market tightening. Something else is going on. But the labor, they, the experts out there, they didn't offer an explanation as to what it actually might be that's causing this. Here's what I believe is the cause. Today, the federal government has made it far too easy for the American people to get on government welfare. Increased unemployment benefits, you have renter's assistance dollars, folks that are continuing to receive Medicaid even after they've risen above the income level requirements, all of these promote a culture of complacency, a culture that believes that the bare minimum is enough, a culture that no longer focuses on the importance of hard work. So today I want to talk to you about what President Coolidge's example was and also South Dakota's example. Together, these two can figure, help us figure out exactly what America needs to do to focus again on work ethic and hopefully we can get our nation back on track. Now, President Coolidge implicitly understood the value of hard work. He once said, all growth depends on activity. Life is only manifest by action. 
There's no development physically or intellectually without effort, and effort means work. Coolidge's family has a long history of hard work and respect for American freedom. His great-great-grandfather was a military officer in the Continental Army. He served during the Revolutionary War. And President Coolidge was a hard worker himself. And he was a man of few words. I think all of us know that. Uh, he let his actions speak for himself. He succeeded academically and also in his debate classes and he graduated with honors from Amherst College and became a country lawyer in Massachusetts. He practiced commercial law because he didn't want to spend all of his time in a classroom or in a courtroom, but he also gained a reputation as being someone who always showed up for the hard jobs. When he got involved in politics, he worked hard at that too and was elected to the city committee in Northampton. Then he was elected city solicitor. You know all of these items in his resume, but you also know that when he lost that role, he was appointed to the clerk of courts. By 1909, at the age of 36, he was elected the mayor of Northampton. And for a man who was born on the 4th of July, it's fitting that he spent his next 20 years in public service. Over that period of 20 years, he would be reelected mayor, state senator, president of the Senate, the lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, then Vice President of the United States, took over the presidency after the death of President Harding and then was elected president on his own merit. I'm not here today just to give you a step-by-step -step of President Coolidge's political biography. You can get that from reading a book and I've got a very good book that I could recommend, Miss Amity. <laughs> but there is a point here. In Calvin Coolidge's decades of public service, he never settled. He never said good enough. He continuously looked for new opportunities to lead. He worked hard to earn every single one of those positions. And when he did, he didn't go along to get along. He didn't take the easy path, and he often made unpopular decisions or went against the political grain to make sure that the right thing was done and that he believed in what needed to be done. When he became president, America was still very much recovering from a world war. But he didn't wallow in that recovery. He drove America forward, always looking to see what challenges may be on the horizon. In President Coolidge's first annual message to Congress, what we might call his first State of the Union speech, he had the foresight to draw attention to several issues that would become much more serious as our nation's history went on. He pointed out to the new communist regime in Russia, which America would contend with for decades, and its violations against the cherished rights of humanity. He discussed the cost of the federal debt, which at the time was, it was only $7.2 billion, what I wouldn't give to get back to a situation where that was the debt that our country owed. He would be the last president to actually shrink the size of federal government. And let me tell you, that does take commitment and hard work. In fact, during Coolidge's presidency, he actually cut the overall debt by about 40%, and he did it while cutting taxes for the American people. As Congress and the President debate about what they should do about our federal debt today, they should look to his example. President Coolidge stood for the equality of all people before it was even popular to do so, and he repeatedly argued in his annual messages to Congress that we must extend to all Americans the elements of equal opportunity and equal protection under the law. He denounced the crime of lynching that was too common at that time, and he did not do this because it was easy. If it was, then civil rights legislation would have passed decades sooner. He stood for equality because it was the right thing to do. Calvin Coolidge's leadership would be the catalyst for the Roaring Twenties, considered by many to be one of the greatest periods of prosperity in American history. He recognized that taxes were really a moral issue stating that the power of a certain amount of, to take a certain amount of property or income is only another way of saying that the citizen must work for a certain portion of time for the government. It's a good reminder to all elected leaders today that all taxpayer dollars really belong to the people. Coolidge did his job even when he didn't like it. He was personally opposed to prohibition, but he faithfully enforced the laws of the nation. It was his duty, and he exercised his duty as a leader and as a representative of the American people. He didn't just talk about work ethic. He lived and he led by his example. So that's 
how I try to do my job as governor of South Dakota. To lead, to live by example, to work hard. Now most of you in this room probably didn't even know who I was three years ago, did you? <laughs> probably first started to hear about me when people were kicking me in the head on the national news every night for the decisions that I was making in South Dakota. You heard about me at the beginning of the COVID pandemic because people disagreed with the fact that I wasn't shutting South Dakota down. You know, in many ways during that time, I did what every other governor was doing. I studied the science and the data, the facts, learned all that I possibly could to help protect my people. I was on conference calls with other governors, with epidemiologists, with health experts, trying to learn information about this virus and what we could use for mitigation measures. But I took it a step further than most of those other governors did too. I spent a lot of time with my general counsel, with constitutional experts who, to really find out what my authority was as governor, what authority I didn't have as governor, because I believed that when governors and when leaders overstep their authority, especially in a time of crisis, that that's when we break this country. The fact is, is I did not have the authority to issue mandates or lockdowns. We respected the Constitution. We respected the foundation and the liberty that our nation was built on. The greatest American foundational truth is freedom, our experiment in self-government. I trusted my people in South Dakota to exercise personal responsibility to make the best decisions for themselves and for their families. We did not lock my people down and we did not mandate anything in our state. In fact, at the end of the day, I was the only governor in the country who never once ordered a single business or church to close. I didn't even define what an essential business was or wasn't because I don't believe that governors have the authority to tell businesses that they aren't essential. We gave South Dakotans the freedom to work. When President Trump offered those elevated unemployment benefits to the rest of the country, I was the only governor in the country who said, thank you, Mr. President, for that flexibility, but no thanks. Our people want to work. The very next week, our unemployment claims dropped in half and people were working. Earlier, I was talking about those labor statistics and the participation rate. It dropped to 60.1% during the pandemic, and it didn't fully recover. Today, in South Dakota's labor force participation rate is 68.3%, far above the rest of the nation. <laughs> and we don't have more uh, working age adults in South Dakota. In fact, South Dakota has a higher share of senior citizens in the nation as a whole. It's that our people recognize the value of work, of serving each other, getting up every day and having a purpose. And they appreciate having leaders who emphasize it for them too. When members of Congress are asked why South Dakota wasn't spending our federal renters assistance money that they sent out from the federal government, I replied back to those members of Congress that South Dakota renters enjoy something even better than government handouts, a job. And then we returned $81 million in renter's assistance money back to the federal government. <laughs> South Dakota came out of the pandemic with the strongest economy in America. We have the fastest rising incomes in the country. We have the fastest increase in new housing developments and our children are outperforming students than any other state in the classrooms as well. Today, our population is growing at five times the national average. And remember, South Dakota doesn't have beaches or beautiful Januaries to recruit people to come and live with us. The reason people move to South Dakota is because they want freedom. The people picked up their lives across this country when they heard our story, and they moved their families and their businesses to our state. We're breaking records every single year for tourism because year after year, we've told our story and people wanted to come and see what this freedom looked like. Our state revenues are so strong this year that I'm ready to deliver the largest tax cut in state history for our people that live in South Dakota. That is South Dakota's story. Our state has the best state motto in the nation, under God, the people rule. But that could just as well be a national motto as well. In America, we are not and we will not be ruled by a class of so-called elite experts. 
We the people are the government. But in a lot of ways, it's a story that is just getting started. We gained the nation's attention during the pandemic. We set an example of freedom for the rest of the country, and I hope that South Dakota can continue to set an example for the rest of the nation when it comes to work ethic as well. It would have been easier for me to follow the crowd definitely and to shut down our state. It would have been easier for me to tell South Dakotans to stay home, don't go to work, rely on the government money to get by, but we did not do what was easy. We worked hard and we did it together. As President Coolidge said, I cannot think of anything that represents the American people so adequately as honest work. When you think of South Dakota, you may think of freedom, but you also might be thinking of rolling fields of corn and soybeans. You might think of Mount Rushmore or the beautiful Black Hills. If you can't picture them right now, you should probably come visit us real soon. <laughs> You might not think of President Calvin Coolidge in South Dakota, but you should as well. It was in 1927 that President Calvin Coolidge spent his entire summer in South Dakota. He had planned to only spend three weeks with us, but he loved it so much that he ended up spending three months in our state. At the time, there was a man that was hard at work, working to carve faces on a mountain. President Coolidge visited Mount Rushmore that summer, even though Guts and Borglum would not complete his work at Mount Rushmore for another 14 years. The famously frugal Coolidge even promised federal funding for the project. He saw what it could become, stating that this memorial will be another national shrine to future generations to repair, to declare their continuing allegiance to independence, to self-government, to freedom, and to economic justice. Later in that same speech, he talked about South Dakotans too. He said, the people of South Dakota are taking the lead in the preparation of this memorial out of their meager resources because the American spirit is strong among them. I could not agree more. President Coolidge's summer White House that year was the state game lodge in Custer State Park. I can't blame him for that at all. It is my favorite place in the world. I love Custer State Park. The sweeping hills are home to thundering herds of bison. Maybe you've seen footage from our annual Buffalo Roundup that we hold every single year. It's my favorite event. The towering stone needle mountains make for the most beautiful landscapes anywhere in the world. And the lakes, streams, well, President Coolidge spent plenty of time pulling fish out of those streams. Although Governor Bulow at the time he was a little sneaky. He was filling those streams with old live felled trout to make sure that the president <laughs> was going to have luck every day. So maybe the president didn't have to work that hard every single day. <laughs> Perhaps it was the peaceful landscape that led President Coolidge to make one of his biggest announcements from our state, that his career of hard work would be coming to an end. When President Coolidge announced in August of 1927 that he would not be seeking re-election, he made that announcement from the Black Hills of South Dakota. He invited reporters into his office. He handed them a paper with a single typed line on it that said, I do not choose to run for president in 1928. When the reporters asked him if he had anything to add, he simply said, no. <laughs> and then he left. <laughs> Sometimes I wish that reporters were that easy to deal with today. In February 2010, when I was the assistant majority leader in the South Dakota House of Representatives, folks had been encouraging me and my family to run for Congress. They weren't having very much luck. They had been trying to talk to us about that for a couple of years. Until one day I was sitting in my office early in the morning and I received three phone calls from different places in the country from people that did not know each other at all and had never met, all within a half hour where each of them asked me, have you ever considered running for Congress? All of them had the same message, that we need you. It was so much of a coincidence that I remember I hung up the phone and called my husband Brian and I said, listen, I've gotten these three phone calls from people who don't know each other and I know we've been saying no to this for a very long time, but now I'm concerned that we're maybe being disobedient to what God is asking us to do. So our family ended up renting a cabin in the Black Hills to pray about it, talk about it. We spent some time sledding, playing games. We talked, but I'll be honest with you, it was a miserable weekend. 
I took some walks around the Black Hills to pray, and the Black Hills are good for both of those items, walking and praying. They're beautifully rugged and silent, but by the time we left the hills, our family had come to the conclusion that we would run. If we lost, they'd leave us alone. <laughs> but we would run for Congress, and we would do it as a family. In 2020, when I was weighing decisions about how to get South Dakota through the COVID pandemic, Custer State Park is where our family also went to talk and to pray and to connect with God. Sometimes you just have to go somewhere quiet to listen for God's voice. I believe that's what President Coolidge experienced too. I feel very tied to this man who died about 40 years before I was even born. He helped make my state's greatest monument happen, a place where some of you might have learned about me for the very first time. He retreated to the same beautiful park in South Dakota to make some of the most consequential decisions of his life. He had to make tough decisions, even though they weren't popular, because he knew they were the right thing to do. But I feel most close, closely tied to him because of his admiration for the United States of America, for our founding principles, and for our nation's work ethic. He knew that there was something fundamentally different that sets our country apart from any other. In perhaps his most famous speech on the 150th birthday of our nation, commemorating the signing of the Declaration of Independence, in that speech, President Coolidge gave us a reminder that I want every one of us to take home today. He said, governments do not make ideals, but ideals make governments. Of course, the government can help to sustain ideals and can create institutions through which they can be better observed. But their source, by their very nature, is in the people. The people have to bear their own responsibilities. Let me repeat that. The people have to bear their own responsibilities. It is a responsibility of the American people to work hard and to put food on the table for themselves and for their loved ones. We have recognized this personal responsibility throughout our nation's history, and we cannot lose sight of it now. It is not the role of government to do that for us, and the government cannot do it better than we can. Yes, we should take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. Yes, we should help those who have fallen on hard luck, though brief and in a way that helps them really get back on their feet. America's work ethic is the stuff of legends. From tall tales like Paul Bunyan to war heroes like Nathan Hale to sports heroes like Michael Jordan, America loves a story about hard work. Calvin Coolidge lived such a life. I'm proud that South Dakota has had a small part to play in his life, and I'm honored to be able to join with you to celebrate this great leader in history. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. May God bless you all. May God bless President Coolidge's memory, and may God continue to bless the United States of America.